Living in the Past is a Turtle Mysteries of Azeroth and Everlook Broadcasting Production. <laughs> This is Living in the Past, your Everlook Broadcasting Company weekly show about all things Turtle Mysteries of Azeroth. Today is Friday, March 15th, 2024, and I'm Dan, your host for the next hour. Happy Friday once again, everyone. This is a jam-packed show. We have a lot to talk about. It's mostly stuff that I want to talk about. We're a little light on news, per se. Brogreg actually hinted at that in his show earlier today. However, there are things I really want to get to. So let's get right to it. In our first segment here today, we're going to be talking about patch notes. They came out a couple days ago on the 13th. We're also going to be talking here a little bit about the show we had on Tuesday with myself, Rograg, and Akalix. Going into a little more detail as to what's going on with that, what I think is going to need to change, what I think is done well with it, and so on and so forth. Uh, we are also, I'm also going to mention uh, a meeting actually happening tomorrow. So today is the 15th, tomorrow is the 16th of March. Um, we have a meeting with the radio staff tomorrow, the first of its kind. Uh, and we're going to be going over a lot of ideas for the future. Uh, and then I'm very excited to, to hear thoughts from the whole team about that. Device don't turn on. So my my Amazon device just activated in front of me and I'm like don't you beep at me <laughs> don't don't you shout at me I'm gonna unplug you <laughs> I'm being paranoid I'm being very paranoid but I'm gonna unplug it for right now I don't want it to start shouting at me all of a sudden uh in addition I, I am gonna just talk about uh, in this first segment here plans for the next few weeks uh and, and making sure everyone is on the same page scheduling wise uh, we also will, in a few moments, talk about our music selections for this week. Then, in our second segment, we're going to talk about Stromgard. Yeah, we're going to just talk about Stromgard. Um, this is this is something that I've been itching to uncork here recently. Um, and with knowing that one of the islands that is coming into play with the Grim Batal update is... A former Stromgard stronghold. Say that five times fast. I dare you. I wanted to recap a lot of what Stromgard was. Because Stromgard was incredibly important in, in Warcraft 2. But then in Warcraft 3, all of a sudden, it really doesn't exist anymore. And then, of course, in World of Warcraft, we see what has happened. Um, so I want to... Turn the clock back a little bit and talk about Stromgard. And then in our third segment, excuse me, uh, I am going to go into Uldum. And <laughs> we, we, we're, we're pretty darn sure, looking from the outside in, we're pretty darn sure we're not getting Uldum anytime soon. It's not happening. I wish it would, but I'm going to take some time to talk about what I would want to see should Uldum ever come in to the game for Turtle. And certainly, um, I, I have no control over that. While I'm staff, I, I am radio staff. I have control over the radio. <laughs> I don't actually have any say or control over what, what is implemented in the game. But I'm gonna. I'm just share. I want to share my thoughts as to what I would want to see with with Uldum. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get into four minutes plus into the show, our first segment. I'm taking my time here today. I guess I, I don't know. Um, let's get into the patch notes. Let's actually talk about the March 13th 
patch notes. Um, I'm just going to read through them real quick, and then I'm going to talk about one or two. Uh, Hygel Nectar is no longer available for purchase for drink vendors who, for some reason, had found them in their in their inventories. Uh, they've also attempted to address an issue with the temporary flying mounts that allowed players to continue flying after they expired. I, I'm saddened to think about mounts expiring, but I'm, I'm sure they're resting in peace. They also have resolved the issue of mount auras and their icons being invisible when mounting up after reaching the buff limit. They've removed the 40-yard forced leash from Gila Jim Island mobs. Gila Jim's Island, rather. I didn't say that correctly. Uh, they fixed an issue with guild tabards not appearing appropriately. They disabled, and this one freaked people out. And this is one we're going to talk about. They disabled the Alliance version of Barov Peasant Collars. They did not provide... Turtle didn't provide context on that one. We're going to talk about that. Jaden R. Depth now cast Blink when stunned. The Emerald Rod will no longer function as a secondary weapon. And they fixed the summoning position of regular Windstone mobs. The Windstones... The... <laughs> The the long and tragic history of the Windstones in in Silithus continues. Let's go back really quick and talk about disabling the Alliance version of the Barov Peasant Callers. So, this one, I wasn't... I read this, and I immediately go to Vrograg because I trust him... For, for game information and updates. And I ask him, why are they disabling the peasant callers? <laughs> Which is the exact same thought that so many community members had. Why are they disabling the peasant callers? I'm so confused. Why are they disabling the peasant callers? If, if you looked at the forums, and specifically the forum thread for the patch notes... I think three or four people just there were like, why are they disabling the peasant callers? And then, of course, people hop in game, and they equip their peasant caller, Alliance or Horde, and they use it, and they see, oh, it still works. Everything's fine. What's going on? This is specifically in arenas. This was very specifically in arenas. However, this did cause a minor panic. Which, I'm going to be honest, I thought was hilarious. Um, I had no context. I didn't realize that this was an arena issue. But it turns out, the Horde version of the Bear of Peasant Collar has been disabled in arenas for a while. A very long time. And this was just... This was just an update to also disable the Alliance version in arenas. Um, but I, I went to Ro Rograg... Um, and I'm like, is everything okay? What What's going on? Why are they disabling the peasant callers? And he had literally just got done with AQ40. And he's like, no, everything's, everything's fine with them. Which is, which is funny because if you don't know, you pretty much require... Well, you don't require, but it makes the fight a lot easier. Princess Huron in AQ40, if everyone... Or if people uh, stair step rather, uh, summoning their peasant callers uh, throughout the the fight, it makes the amount of poison damage that's done much easier to deal with. Ex like super much easier to deal with. So that was that was a funny that was a funny moment today. Uh, not today, but uh, this week. And then um, the windstones in Silithus continuing to be a problem. Continuing to be troublesome. I have only really heard the tip of the iceberg on this. So the last five or six attempts to repair the the windstones in some capacity. Um, and I'll be honest, I just find it hilarious. Like, there, there, there's no real context behind that. I just think it's so funny that for some reason the windstones continue to, to just cause problems 
over and over again because they can. I, I, it's hilarious to me. But those are the patch notes. That's the patch notes for this week. It came out March 13th. Make sure you pull them up as well if you have any questions. And, of course, make sure you check out, oh, what's that? The brand new GitHub page. I forgot to actually mention this in my intro here because I actually forgot about it. But I linked it to to uh, a few folks earlier this week when it happened. Um where is it real quick? Here it is. It's over on the the turtle Twitter, the the the, the turtle Twitter. Um if you go to turtle-wow.org slash bug tracker. I shouldn't say it's like a brand new GitHub per se, but it is the best way for bugs to be reported and tracked for Turtle Wow. So if you do encounter a bug in some way. Make sure you go over to turtle-wow.org slash bug-tracker. I should have had that prepared. I didn't have that prepared if it wasn't like super obvious. I should have had that prepared. (laughs) Uh, Really quick here now. um, Just a recap of Under the Shell. Uh, If you didn't get to listen to it on Tuesday, we are going to have it on the YouTube page as soon as possible. I've already put it in for getting it rendered out for the YouTube page. Um, It was a really fascinating discussion. And while a majority of it, like the first 40 minutes or so, it was just basic coverage structure, how how it's going to be formatted. It is going to be once a month, so we don't burn people out. Uh, But then the the last like 25 minutes was was a solid conversation on where the class changes are heading and it was it was really fascinating it was a really good conversation i i i loved i loved that part especially and while uh, i certainly had a little fun with it i was poking the bear a little bit with both both acolix and uh, acolix and rograg i've been pronouncing acolix's name wrong this entire time and I, I fully blame Vrograg. So I might start pronouncing Vrograg's name wrong at some point. I just don't know how, why, or when. I know why, actually, to troll him. But that's not the point. Akalix's name is pronounced Akalix. And he just doesn't care that much to correct people. Because <laughs> Vrograg started pronouncing it Akalix. I'm I'm going to do better. I'm going to do my best to do better. <laughs> um, moving on, though, we do have a meeting with all of the radio staff, or as many of the radio staff as we could gather, uh, coming up tomorrow. And while we haven't had the meeting yet, so I don't know exactly what we're going to talk about, um, I do have a few things that I'm just going to mention to them briefly. Uh, all of them wonderful. Again, the the Valentine's Day stuff in particular went really well. Um, and you can go over to the Everlook Broadcasting Company YouTube page uh, to listen back to that to that wonderful skit. That was hilarious. Well, well done to the team across the board. But we do have a meeting here to plan out future events and activities, uh, future skits, uh, and we have, I believe, a vast majority showing up to that, which is really exciting. Uh, And and speaking of planning here for the next few weeks, plans for the next few weeks here. um, First off, I won't be here next week. Uh, Next week, I am taking off for PAX East. Um, I'm going to be pretty well occupied Wednesday through Sunday next week with that. Uh, However, as I mentioned on the last show, if you are coming into Boston for PAX East in any way, feel free to drop me a line. I am Dan over on the Turtle Wow Discord, you can reach out to me directly. Um, Feel free to let me know, because I certainly don't mind meeting community members and saying hello, Um, sharing that that group Vanilla Wow passion is always always fun. So if you you are coming into town for PAX East here in Boston next week, drop me a line. Let me know. It's It's always fun to meet folks. Um... 
going through my notes here real fast. I, I was throw I threw myself off by wanting to mention the new bug tracker. Um, so I'm little. I'm suddenly like, okay, where am I in my notes? I do I do actually plan notes out for these shows. Scarily enough, that that's good though. That's good for our first segment here. Um, let us talk about the music for today, and because on Sunday. It's St. Patrick's Day, and I am here in Boston, and we are we are very Irish sometimes. <laughs> Today is going to be all about the Irish tune, so we're starting out with some more familiar stuff. Shipping up to Boston, the Foggy Dew, and Drunken Lullabies is how we're going to open up this first break. It's going to be an Irish six-pack today, by the way. Our second break, we're going to have another three songs. Different different bands, though. So, shipping up to Boston is uh, Dropkick Murphys. The Foggy Dew... I actually did not write this down. One of the few things I did not write down. Um, the Foggy Dew is done by... If you're here, I'm actually not seeing it in my music list because I am I am well prepared. I have, to, I have to search for it. Fine. Young Dubliners. That's my Young Dubliners cover of the song. Uh, and then, of course, Drunken Lullabies, uh, Flog and Molly. So we're going to go ahead and get into that first break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk some lore. We're going to talk about Stromgard. What's the deal with Stromgard? In your best Jerry Seinfeld impression. And then, after that, our second half of the Irish Six Pack. And then we're going to talk about Uldum. You're listening to Living in the Past with myself, Dan, right here on Everlook Broadcasting. The musical tracks for this episode have been removed due to YouTube copyright. To listen to the full episodes with music... Tune in to Everlook Broadcasting every Friday with the in-game radio widget. Welcome back to Living in the Past with myself, Dan. Happy March 15th. It's good to have you here today. As a reminder, there will not be a show next week. Uh, I'm taking a little bit of time off because PAX East is happening, and I am going to be busy essentially from Wednesday through Sunday. So there's just not an opportunity for me to record the show for next week. Now, let's get into our second segment here. Uh, We're going to be talking about Stromgard. Now, not a lot of attention is put on the original human nations of the Eastern Kingdoms. In fact, most people don't realize that the human nation was Azeroth for the longest time. It wasn't Stormwind, it was Azeroth. And the name ended up changing to, okay, suddenly it's the name of a continent, to suddenly it is the name of the planet. So people really don't take the time to think about the original human nations. Lordaeron, to a certain extent, but not not so much. Which is why... I feel like it's important, especially with the content that is coming down the line that we know about for the uh, next major patch and raid tier, to actually talk about Stromgard a little bit. Now, along with Lordaeron, Dalaran, um, oh, I forgot the, the one in the mountains that betrayed everyone, Alterac. Gilneas and and, uh, and Azeroth. Th- those were the major. Oh, and um, uh, oh, my memory is failing me today. <laughs> uh, Kultaras. There we go. Um, those were the original human nations. Um, however, they all came from one kind of supernation called Arathor. 
where Arathor was its own actual nation, and each of the other individual ones that I just mentioned were more city-states. Also, I'm proud that I got there eventually with those names. My brain is not all here today. If that wasn't too obvious. It's not always there, but today it's extra not here. Anywho, all of these human nations came from a larger nation called Arathor. And Arathor, while it held together for a while, especially because of the conflict with the trolls, which we'll get into here in a moment, it eventually split up into all of these different kingdoms, or these almost city-states, um, which I think is a better term. When you look at the geography of the of the world, they're more city-states than actual nations. I digress. The one nation that really held on to what Arathor was all about was Stromgard. As far as we understand, all the tribes uh, of humans that came together to form the nation of Arathor used the color red. Just as a general concept, they used the color red in a lot of things. That's one of the things that Stromgard held on to. Another thing was the martial traditions of uh, of Arathor, where it was a lot about big weapons. It was a lot about killing trolls. Stromgard held on to those as well, heavily, uh, to the point where uh, the royal bloodline of uh, of Stromgard, Danath is actually part of that bloodline, as a side note, uh, the Trollbanes. All about killing trolls. Uh, one of their house weapons is a giant sword named Trollkalar. It, it's, it's unfortunate that we really didn't see uh, uh, Stromgard survive into World of Warcraft, but unfortunately... With what happened during the Burning Crusade, not the Burning Crusade, uh, the um, invasion of the Burning Legion. My goodness, my brain stopped there as soon as I said Burning Crusade. Like, no, no, that ain't it, Chief. <laughs> uh, with what happened during the invasion of the Burning Legion, Stromgard took a big hit. Um, they initially... They had contributed so many resources and troops to the Alliance. They were, they were one of the few factions that when Lothar and Terranus proposed the Alliance, they were one of the few to jump in, like, right away. Like, Stromgrove was pretty much like, yep, we see what's going on. Them orcs is bad. We gotta stop them. They have a very good memory from the Troll Wars, again, when it was still Arathor and not the divided city-states. Kul Taras was also one of the nations that jumped in headfirst. Uh, they understood. They understood the assignment. Unfortunately, because Stromgard had contributed so much to the Alliance, their forces were spread not just throughout the Eastern Kingdoms, but much of the Beyond the Dark Portal Alliance Expeditionary Force was made up of Stromgard troops. Because of that, when threats suddenly faced Stromgard on the home front, they simply did not have the strength to deal with it. The remnants of Alterac in the Syndicate, for example, they could not deal with this problem on the home front. Ogres suddenly moving in en masse into the Arathi Highlands. They couldn't deal with that threat. And Stromgard was ruined as a result. One thing, though, that they had maintained the entire time was one of the islands off the coast of the wetlands and south shore. And they used this as both a fortification and a prison. And from my understanding... That's one of the islands that's going to be included 
in that patch with Grim Batol. And this is why I bring this up. The militaristic history of Stromgard combined with being able to ask the question, what happened to all of that, I think provides a very unique opportunity for us to see not just the strength of of Stromgard from a, 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 almost like a yesteryear perspective. Perhaps the island is untouched and there's still Stromgard forces there. Who knows? Or perhaps it's a really good opportunity to show that ruined glory that Stromgard had. Who know? Who knows what's going to be on that island? Uh, pr- pronounced Tolbarad, by the way. Who knows what's going to be o- over there? I'm excited. I'm excited to see exactly what the turtle team decides to do with that. Because again, this is this is going to be a good opportunity to dig into. Warcraft 2 lore and bring it into modern Turtle WoW history. So I'm excited. I want to know what's going on with that. As as all of us do, we all want to know what's going on with the Grimbatol patch because we're getting, you know, a a new raid, a new raid tier, (laughs) a new zone, and then multiple new sub zones. Which I think is really exciting. With that being said, let's go ahead and move on to our second break of the broadcast. As I mentioned, this is the second half of the Irish six-pack we're using to celebrate St. Patrick's Day right here on Living in the Past. This break is going to be Give Us the Beer by the Black Tartans, Whiskey Devils, done by the Mahones and dressing Scottish drinking Irish talking rubbish by Lipton's Orphan these are these are a little more obscure but they are absolute bangers maybe they're obscure for me because I'm a white dude in the United States but uh, they're they're when I found them I I loved every moment of them so enjoy the music when we come back we're gonna talk Uldum Look forward to that coming up right here on Living in the Past. The musical tracks for this episode have been removed due to YouTube copyright. To listen to the full episodes with music, tune in to Everlook Broadcasting every Friday with the in-game radio widget. Welcome back to our final segment of Living in the Past with myself, Dan, here on Everlook Broadcasting Company. It's good to have you here today for our final segment of the broadcast. I wanted to take some time to explore what I would want to see with Uldum if we ever got it. Now, you're about to say to yourself, self, I am tired of hearing Dan talking about Uldum. You're not getting Uldum. Stop trying to make Uldum happen. And I'm here to tell you... I, I don't care. I'm still going to talk about Uldum. I want to see Uldum. Really badly. So, let me just share some thoughts. And I'm going to open with what I don't want to see. What I don't want to see in Uldum, more than anything else, is the fun park zone that we got in Cataclysm. I really... I really feel like, and again, this you've heard me mention this before, what we got with Uldum in Cataclysm was a missed opportunity to do something that really dived deep into old Titan lore and showed what could have been done or what they were trying to do with the old god threat. Maybe it was a ruined uh, situation or uh, uh, an occurrence where, you know, something got loose. That's great. And maybe I'm diving into my ideas a little too early here in this segment. But you you get my thought process. The Uldum we got with Cataclysm, which I describe as a fun park, 
really felt like a failed opportunity. The writing really didn't feel like it was there. The the actual background and lore really didn't feel satisfying for me. Um, it could have it could have been done a lot better. Now let's 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 throw a few ideas out there because I'm I'm all about solutions. I don't like just talking about problems. I like talking about solutions. So really, to the meat and potatoes of what I want to talk about here with ideas. For Uldum and what I would want to see. While I understand the temptation to make it a zone again. Whether it's an underground zone or or otherwise. I understand the temptation to do that because it's what we had previously. But, but, let me, let me roll this idea by you all instead. What if we turned it into a kind of Scarlet Monastery style set of 20 mans where there's two or three wings that you go into and they scale in difficulty. So the first wing is like the the basic, you know, structure of of Uldum. It's like the you know, the dormitories or the support areas or, or just the non, non-emergency non parts of the facility. And it's kind of the easy, the easy tier to do. And then you have the armory wing or the weapons development wing of the... Uh, uh, of Uldum, and that's kind of the medium tier. And then you could have, you know, the containment wing. I'm really, I'm kind of going SCP on this a little bit, secure, contain, protect. But I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. We're going to roll with that. The, the third wing is like the containment wing. And that's where all the dangerous stuff was, was stored away and something got out. And it's starting to wreak havoc. Let's say a few of the old gods minions that were held there decided, okay, we're going to combine forces or combine biology or morph together into something much more dangerous. That that's just that that's like my starting thought. But more than anything else, I would want to see an Uldum that really explores the space of what a giant underground Titan facility would look like if it wasn't Uldaman, which was essentially completely Shreked. Like you go, you go through Uldaman right now and the, the, the overall facility is barely tied together through dig sites. I would want to see in Uldam, Something that hadn't been entirely caved in and had to be dug out. Okay, you get through the doors. Something broke out through the doors, as it as it currently looks like. And you're able to get in. And things are mostly, like, the overall superstructure is intact. Even though maybe a lot of the wings are ruined when in regards to armaments, furniture... The actual doorways themselves, maybe there's partial cave-ins or collapses, but overall, it's still like structurally intact. And I think I think that would be an incredible concept to explore. What if things didn't have to be entirely dug out? And maybe you involve the Explorers League in some way. I mean, th- th- there's there's not a bad reason to do that. Just. Don't make it about the dwarves, make it about the titans. Or make it about, rather, the titans' creations that were assigned to the facility to figure out a solution to the old god threat. And while what I'm suggesting actually sounds like the um, the titan facility from Battle for Azeroth, I forget the exact Ulda name for it, but where it had the uh, spawned old god in it. 
uh, the old god of I I think they titled old god of corruption. It sounds similar to that, but without the whole troll spin on it. I'll be honest, I did not I didn't like did not like Battle for Azeroth. I'm gonna keep that not the point of this video though. Um I really my my thought my initial thought of having like wings to the raid, I actually really like that because we don't see that anywhere. Like we really we don't see that as its own separate raids where you can tackle them one at a time. You do have wings, like in Nexramus, where you know, you're you're going you're going into one wing after another and you have to tackle them one at a time. But it's still it's still like one raid you get done in one night or two nights. Shout out to all the guilds, by the way, who are actually one nighting uh next Ramus. That's not easy to do. I, I think there's a lot of space to explore with Uldum. I think there's a lot of wasted potential with Uldum still to this day. And I would love, more than anything else, to see Turtle actually look into what could be done with Uldum. With that being said, we do need to go ahead and close up shop for today. As a reminder again, no show next week. I'm going to be at PAX East. So if you are coming out to Boston, come on by, say hello, get into my DMs on Discord. I would love to see you there. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. Our nostalgia continues, even though today's broadcast is at an end, and I hope you enjoyed the show here today. A huge thank you to the Turtle developers, moderators, staff, and volunteers. Without the entire team's hard work and dedication, we wouldn't have this station or server group. An additional thank you to the audio engineers and creators here for the use of their soundtracks they've created, which we use for segment transitions and intro audio. If you'd like to find out more about what I do, I invite you to check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at the Dan Nation and my series Ancient Lore, a recapture of the spirit of my original podcast, The Ancient of Lore. Until, not next Friday, but the Friday after, let's keep living in the past.